Lord, thank you for giving us this time together. Thank you for your word. May you speak your word into our heart that we may know you, that we may walk with you, Lord, surrendered to your life, your will. And we thank you for being our Lord, our Savior, our God, our King, and our friend. We thank you so much for this day. May you teach us now in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in Isaiah chapter 50 as we go through the book of Isaiah. And we're at a place where Israel has caused their own judgment to fall upon them. The problems that they faced, the difficulties, the being led away as a nation captive into a strange land, the bondage and captivity in that land, and all the oppression that was upon them was actually of their own making. In fact, the Lord will use an expression that basically he did not, as God is married to Israel, if you, if you have that picture, and Israel is, is the bride of God, God did not write Israel a bill of divorce. Israel walked out on the marriage. That in that culture, if a man was going to divorce his wife, he had to give a bill of divorce. He had to state within that letter his, his, uh, what he was going to do, his intentions and, and, uh, and why, and he would write it, and he would then give it to her, and he would say, I'm ending this marriage. And you will see as we look into the first verse, God says, I never wrote that letter. I was not the one that separated us. In fact, it was you who walked out on the marriage. You desired your own ways, your own things, your own lust and sin. You walked in contrary to my word. You walked in rebellion to my ways and my counsel. You went after the gods of the world. You were unfaithful to me. It was not that I was unfaithful to you. And even in that understanding, there's comfort because God is never unfaithful in the relationship that he establishes with you. He is a faithful God. He is a a loving God. He will continue to be faithful even when we're not. And so as it's stated in the beginning, verse 1, let's read it. Thus saith the Lord, where is the bill of your mother's divorcement? Where is it? Remember, Israel had said earlier on, if you remember, in chapter 49, you can look there just to get a little background. In chapter 49, as Israel, because of their sin, was brought into captivity, and here Isaiah is prophetically speaking of an event that that would be 100 to 200 years in the future, he's speaking to them that this situation would unfold in their life and that they would find themselves in a strange land under strange rulers amongst a, a pagan culture, and there would be a time and a season where Israel will cry out and say, God has forsaken us. He he left us here to die. He he doesn't care about us. Look at all that we're going through, and yet we don't hear from him. He doesn't help us. We have to continue to endure all this heartache and trial and oppression and, and attacks upon our life. Where is God? And they were distraught because of their own circumstances, yet it was their own actions that put them into that predicament. It was their own behavior that put them into those hard times. Yet it's so easy to blame God. 
well, God isn't real, or God doesn't care, or God abandoned us. And the Lord in chapter 49, when in verse 14 it says, but Zion or Israel said, the Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. And the Lord responds to it, can a woman forget her sucking child? Can a woman forget the, the, the child she's nursing? No way. That she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget the natural woman. It, it, you know, some may, may forget their own child because of, of how man has digressed in the sinfulness of man. But he says, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. Now, if you go back to verse 1 of chapter 50, and the heart of Israel that you forgot me, you abandoned me, you left me, God says, well, then where is the bill of divorce? Where, where is the, the, the signing of the breakage of the covenant that I made with you? He said, it is not. Or whom have I put away? Or what of my creditors is to whom I have sold you? What, do you think I pawned you? And if you think I pawned you and had no more use for you, where's your receipt? I, I didn't dump you. I didn't abandon you. I didn't divorce you. You walked out on the relationship. You went your own way. And, and he's declaring this to his people. You, you've gone in your own direction. And he says, Behold, for your iniquities have you sold yourselves. And for your transgressions is your mother put away. It, it, it is because of your doing. It, it, it's because of your lifestyle. And the things that you've been doing are involved and the things you haven't been doing, the, the, the things you haven't been listening and obeying, that's why the calamity, that's why the problems and the, and the lack of peace and the frustration and, and the ongoing problem one after another and, and just the continual attacks that are upon your life and upon your mind and, and just the destruction of your own inner peace. It, it's not because I've abandoned you. But you know, I understand sometimes you feel that way. And sometimes you, you wonder, how much more can I take? Why, why do I have to continue to go through this time and time again? And it, it's so easy to blame everyone else or to blame God instead of saying, Lord, it must be me. There, there must be an area in my life an area that either I'm stubborn, I'm, I'm determined to walk in, an area that I am blind to, that I don't see, an underlying character flaw, a misunderstanding of my own you know, knowledge of, of my own morality, or whatever it is. But we tend to want to blame others for it or think God's abandoned us. Don't worry, it gets better as we go on. <laughs> Glad I came here Sunday, you know, this was great. <laughs> the Lord knows our frailties. He knows our, our, uh, how we operate, the things that we do, and the things we continue to fall into, the patterns of life that we, for some reason, just never seem to escape. The the trials and the problems, and, and, and it tends to follow us no matter how many changes we make in our life, no matter how many things we try to alter or, or adjust, they're, they're still there. And, and unless we look at it and say, Lord, it is us, and then look to him for the solution, we're going to repeat the process year after year after year 
and it will just be an ongoing issue in our life. And this was the time that God was trying to tell Israel, you need to turn to me. You need to seek after me. And, and he goes on and he says, Wherefore, when I came, was there no man? When I called, was there none to answer? I, I continue to try to call out to you. I continue to try to warn you. I, I, I allow difficult times and situations to get your attention and to say you're going down the wrong path. This is not right. This is going to hurt you. This is going to destroy you. These, these things I'm bringing to the surface so that you will repent, that you will turn. I'm calling out to you, but I'm, I'm not hearing an answer from you. I, I'm actually, I, I, I came to seek you, but there's, there's no one. I, I, I came looking for you, but yet you weren't looking for me. You were so caught up in your own will and your own way, in your own counsel, in your own thought, that you really weren't seeking me. But yet I was there. It, 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 the fault the Lord is saying, it's not on my end. It, it, it's not because of the lack of, of ability or interest or concern or love or desire for you. It, it, it's a season in your life that you are determined to continue in a direction that will harm you. That will hurt you. And Israel would continue to walk contrary to the will of God. They, they were put into, into a place of captivity because their own idolatry, and yet in the place of captivity, many of them continued in their idolatry. And God was calling them, are you ready to follow me? And he would listen and they would not answer. God was looking for those that would be seeking after him, but he found them just seeking after their own pleasure and their own life and, and their own issues and, and, and even looking for counsel outside of God. How, how am I going to correct this? And they were finding and trying to determine ways how to get out of their situation that was not in line or not seeking the will of God. And God said, I, I called you. I came and there was no man. When I called, there was none to answer. Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Do you not think or, do you, or, or have I no power to deliver? Oh, do you think your situation is so deep that, that well, it's, it's beyond what God can do? Really? Well, I might as well not even deal with it. I might as well not even change it. It's just a, an area of my life that will always be. Or we sought counsel or direction or trying to resolve things outside of the authority of God instead of turning to him and saying, Lord, you're the present help in my time of trouble. You're the one that I need. You're the only one that can deliver me. You're my only hope in the situation I face, but we thought we could deal with it ourselves or we sought out other counsel besides his or we desired the life we were in and did not want to alter it or change it or have him alter or change it. And he says, I, I called and you didn't answer. Do you think that my hand is short? I, I can't reach into the depth of this situation. There are so many times that I think I have a solution for something, but my solution usually is shallow without a lot of thought to, to provide immediate relief. And I need the Lord because his hand can go deeper into the problem 
If I look at the situation, realize this is a really deep issue, whether it's an issue, a concern, a, an, an area of, of sin or, or area of attitude in my life, I need one that can reach as far deep and deeper than the problem is. And the only one that can do that is the Lord. He can do that. He goes, is my hand too short? Do you think I have no power? I dry up the sea. He's re reminding them of the past situations of deliverance the deliverance out of Egypt when he dried up the Red Sea or parted it, when he dried up the, the Jordan River for them to go into the land. He's reminding them of the past situations that don't you remember that how I've been able to deliver you? Can't you look back to me? Can't you continue to seek after my counsel? And he goes, do I not have the power? I dried up the Red Sea or the sea. I make the rivers a wilderness. Their fish stinketh because there is no water and dieth for thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness. I make sackcloth their covering. I can stop the light from shining. I can hold back the rain. I can make the light to shine. I can turn the moon blood red. I can do all things. I can bring hail and defeat your enemies. I mean, there's a list of things that, that the people of Israel could have referred to and relied on and looked upon and said, my God is able in this situation to deliver us. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord. Let us look to the Lord. Let us put our burden in the hands of the Lord. But they continued in their own way, their own patterns, their old lifestyle, the way they always handle things, the way they always do things did things, regardless of the times along the way that God kept saying, it's not right, you're having turmoil, this is troublesome, this is not the path to go, and you knew best and you walked it anyway. I didn't leave you, he says. You're the ones that abandoned me. And Israel found themselves abandoning their God walking the way of the world, and placed in a land of captivity. And they're wondering, where is God? Why am I here? The Lord God has given me the tongue. Now, this is interesting here. The way the, the text turns here, God is saying, I saw after you, and there was no man. There was none that turned, and, and was looking for me. When I called, there was none answering me. I, I, I called out, and you would not respond. And now what he's going to do is tell them, so because you weren't looking for me, I'm going to seek after you. And he describes, as you're going to read, by sending them their Messiah the Savior, the Redeemer, Jesus our Lord. That you cannot find your way back to me, but I can come get you. I, I can get you. Is my hand not, you know, is it short that it cannot deliver? You may not be able to find your way back, but I can seek and save those that are lost. I can find my way to you and deliver you. I can walk the obedient path that you couldn't. I could live a sinless life that you could not, and I could die a sinner's death for you, though I'm not a sinner. You, you, you start seeing it when you turn these chapters and we get into these chapters in the 50s, you start seeing the picture of Messiah being more visible and clearer than anything in Scripture. It, it, it starts declaring who he is, the, the process of what he would go through. And you start seeing Jesus bring forth the hope for his people. 
He, he first paints a picture and lets them see their hopelessness. You can't do it. You won't do it. You, you, I haven't abandoned you. You walked out of me. I, I haven't forsaken you. You've forsaken me. I've called you. I've tried. I've, I've brought things into your path to turn you, but you wouldn't. So I'm going to send my only begotten son to you. I'm going to send the one who could deliver you, who could save you. And in that statement, I think of another passage of Scripture where the Spirit and the bride say, come. And it's like, Lord Jesus, come. Not only your return, but come into my life. Come be my present help. Come be the one that I rely on. Come be the one that my hope's in. Come and be my all in all because I realize I can't do it without you. I just can't. I, I can't live the Christian life. I can't have the right thoughts. I can't have the, the uh, correct love. I can't do these things. I can't handle these things without the Lord. I will find myself going astray. I will become selfish in my own ideas. I will want what I want. I will fall back onto my old patterns. I need his redemption. I need the Savior. I need Jesus Christ. And the Lord will show Israel that, their need for the Lord, their need for him. And so as we hear in the, in the passage, the text kind of changes. It, it, see it as here the Lord is saying basically, the Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned. He has given Jesus the tongue of the learned, the Messiah, the tongue of the learned. And look what it does. That I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. It, it, isn't that the Lord? He knows how to speak a word in season, in the right time, and it just will bring comfort. I know how to restore you. I know how to bring you back. I know how to lift your burden. I have been gifted, and, and I have the tongue that can speak the exact word that you need. That's why it's imperative that I listen to him. That's why it's important that my ears are attuned to the Lord. Lord, what do you have to say over the matter? What do you have to say in this situation? Lord, I am in desperate need. I am weary. I am troubled. And, and I sit before the Lord under his counsel, and he has the right word in due season. What a, what a blessing that he has for us if we would just sit and listen. We could seek counsel in many directions, but the most profitable, comfort, comforting counsel is going to be from the Lord. It's going to be from him. And in that, as a side note, it's like, Lord, help me to be like you in that way. When, when someone is weary, help me to speak the right word in the due season of time that they're in. Help me to speak the right word. Isn't it, isn't it some, I mean, the tongue, if it's, if it's gifted from heaven, if you would, it can be used in such a wonderful way. But let's face it, not always is my tongue under the authority of heaven. Sometimes my tongue may be under my own authority, if you would. And, and if you're weary and I'm mad, you're not getting any comfort. I will bury you with my tongue. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. <laughs> and you're like, thanks, that was a great word, Kirk. I feel worse now that I counseled with you than before I, you know, made the appointment. Well, that's what I'm here for. But the Lord's not that way. When he sees those that are weary, he can speak a word of comfort. He can encourage the, the heart in the matter, your heart. He, he has that ability. It's, it's one whom we seek. It, it's one whom we look to. His word itself, the word of God, is the best counsel for our life. 
uh, when we have an issue, we should look to the Word of God. We should sit before the Lord. Lord, bring forth your Word. Teach us your Word. Instruct us, Lord, so that, that we have a, a direction in life, that we, we have a plan. We know where to go. Lord, please. You see, many times Israel wouldn't turn to the Lord. You see examples of that. They, they, God went searching for them, but they weren't there. You see it in Ezekiel chapter 22. You can read there verses 29 through 31 or within that area. You see it in Matthew and Luke when the Lord came and the people of Israel weren't looking for their Messiah. And here he wept over Jerusalem because they should have known the day of his visitation, yet they did not seek him, nor were they seeking him. And the Lord said, since you do not seek me, I will seek after you. And there will be one that has a tongue that can bring forth that right word in due season to him who is weary. He wakeneth the morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear as the learn. The, the Lord wants to bring that comfort. He wants to encourage the heart. It, as it says, he waketh the morning by morning and waketh my ear to hear as the learn. What it's basically saying is this servant will come and his heart each day will be what is my Father's will today? What is the Lord's will? He waketh me. What do you have for me today? What is the will for my life? And that's his desire. He's listening. He's intuitive to the Lord. He, he's reflecting on the word of God, and he's walking in the counsel of the Lord. It, it's what he's seeking after. It's what he desires from his God. And the Lord will comfort. The Lord will bring this peace into a person's life as they walk in this way as well. He awaketh my ear to hear as the learned, that I may know the counsel of God. That, that understanding of awaking it, to, to bring it to life, to bring it to understanding, to, to have it to where there's a re, it's a responsive thing. Lord, speak your word that I may respond to it and walk in it. Speak it in such a way that I will have a heart to carry it out, to follow through. And the Lord says that I will bring one that will have this heart, that will walk in this way. And we know Jesus did. He did all that the Father told him. He, he did not go in his humanity according to his own desire or ambition. He went and allowed himself to be governed by the will of the Father. Whatever ever the Father told him to do, that's what he would do. Oh, the heart to wake up in the morning and say, Lord, there's an exciting day to do your will today. What is it, Lord, that I may hear? Lead me that I may follow. To, to have that desire within our hearts of waking up with an excitement to, to seek after God today. You see, the people of Israel, they got weary and no longer were they seeking what the will of God was. In fact, they were just trying to exist in their circumstances to the point of discouragement and and tiredness. And then the Lord sent his anointed to speak to them, a word in due season to speak to the weary, to revive them, to stir them up, one who desired to do the will of God, one who wanted to walk in the counsel of the Lord, one who surrendered his, his authority to, to come under the authority of the Father and do only what he said. Not only was there a present help in time of trouble, there was an example for the people of Israel to walk in the way of the Lord. The Lord God has opened my ear 
and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. The, the concept of that opening the ear, it, it has the understanding of what we would call a bond servant. It, it's not opening the ear in the sense of that I'm tuned to listen, but it has the understanding of being one who surrenders. And when a, a servant would, would want to stay with their master and continue in the home, whether it was because they now have a wife that's in that home or they, they you know, especially they have a love for their master, they would become a bond servant. They would, the master would take the ear and he would take it on, he would like pierce the ear and he would open the ear. And you, you see that concept in Scripture in um, Exodus. Turn to Exodus. Exodus 21. In Exodus 21, it says in verse 1, Now these things are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy a Hebrew servant six years, he shall serve thee, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. For he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master had given him a wife, and she has borne him sons and daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him unto the judges, and he shall also bring him to the door, or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Look at Psalm 40. Psalm 40. Psalm 40, verse 6, Sacrifices and offerings thou didst not desire. My ears hast thou opened. Burn offerings and sin offerings hast thou not required. He's not requiring all the superficial or external things of our, of our worship to him. Then said I, lo, I came in the volume of the books. It is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. You see, the heart of this servant was one that says, I'm here to do the Father's will. I'm not here to do mine. I'm not here to live for self. I'm here to do what the Lord would have me to do. The excitement would be to wake up each morning. What do you have for me today? What would you have me to walk in? What is your counsel for my ears to hear? How can I be obedient to your word? And here God is saying, this is my servant who will come and redeem you. And we know that that is Jesus Christ. He came, he did the will of the Father. He did not seek his own. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He was obedient even unto the cross, even unto the hardships and the torments and, and the lashings. He continued to be obedient. He did not say at any time, this is too hard, this is too much. I can't take it anymore. What about me? I want to live for myself. He continued to surrender his life to the Lord or to the Father. And when I read this, I know that God is saying, I will send one to you that is not governed by his own desires, that not is, you know, dictated by his own sin and, and humanity, but one that will walk after my counsel, one that will walk after my ways, one that will not be tripped up along the way of adversity, but one that will reach into your life to deliver you, to save you, to redeem you, to restore you, to be a present help. I am so glad for Jesus Christ. 
Not only do we see the picture of the cross where even the cross would not persuade him to walk contrary to the counsel of the Father, but I am so grateful that even in the understanding of my life, as I continue to try to live for the Lord, and then I trip up along the way, that it doesn't persuade them in any way of saying, oh, you're just too difficult. You know, Kirk, you're really a basket case. I'm really, you know, I've had enough of you. He, he doesn't just, you know, times get a little hard with Kirk, and he's like, throw him overboard. We're done with Kirk. I, I mean, look what it says here as we read on. It says, I gave my back to the smiters, my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair, and hid not my face from shame and spitting. It couldn't get any clearer about this is what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about the servant of the Lord, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord said, I will do the will of God regardless. I did not stop the floggers. The floggers of the time would take whips, they would take pieces of bone and metal and they would whip the person and they would catch their flesh and they would yank it in such a way that would rip pieces of the flesh off their body. They, it was a brutal beating. Many didn't even survive. And the Lord Jesus knew that's what was in store. And he knew it was the only way to redeem man. And he turned not his back, he, he exposed it, each lash. Many of the Romans would take that whip and flog the people to get them to confess something, to get some, them to reject something, to get them to give up information, to give in other, you know, cohorts in, in whatever schemes or situations. You kind of see a little bit of that if, in the... Um, in the ultra-Islamic, you know, world where they, they will torture you to try to get you to denounce Jesus Christ. And they will continue to torture you until you, you know, denounce the Lord. And I can only imagine the Lord with every beating and the enemy saying, denounce your followers, denounce those you want to redeem. And I can even see it more specific, denounce Billy Graham and, and the Lord saying, no, he will do great work for me. Denounce Kirk, you know, he's nothing but trouble anyway. And the Lord didn't hesitate. He didn't think, hmm, I can keep Billy, but <laughs> would that save me a lash if I denounce Kirk? Boy, he didn't do that. He exposed his back even more, and he said, I'm taking it for Kirk as well. He loves you. He's your God. He will not forsake you. He will not abandon you. And I think about even today that he continues to make intercession on our behalf. He doesn't look down at me and say, what's the use? I've been praying for you for 50-some years. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, but Lord, 60's the charm. I heard somewhere. I'll get it finally when I turn 60. You won't get it. No, he doesn't. He continues to make intercession. Oh, Israel, I didn't divorce you. I didn't sell you off. You walked away from me. But what I did is I sent my son to go after you. I sent my son to bring you back, to redeem you. And I'm like, Lord, thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus. I couldn't walk this life without him. I would have no hope of living for God without his intervention, without his very presence, without a sealing of my spirit, without him being with me and never leaving me. I couldn't do it. And he knew it. And he knew Israel couldn't, so he sent them a Messiah. 
Many of them rejected him. I don't want to. Every day to look to the Lord as my help, as my God, as my Savior, my Deliverer. Lord, quicken me, awaken me to, to wake up morning by morning like Jesus. I want your will, Lord. What is it today? I want to go in your direction. Lead me today, Lord. The Lord said, I will not turn my back. They can pluck my beard out of my cheeks and I will still go in the way of the Lord. I, I, I hide not my face from the shame and the spitting. No, it's going to be less popular for us in these days to stand up and live for Jesus Christ. The world around us is not going to applaud you when you say, no, I think those things are wrong. No, I don't think that a man and a man should marry a woman and a woman. A man and a woman is what God ordained. No, I think God created men and women, and he knows what they are, and don't go changing them. I think these things are true, and they're written in the word of God. You think the world's going to say, way to go, Kirk. They're going to say, oh, you hater. How can we throw you in jail? And we're going to have to stand and say, but this is right and true. And the only way we can is if the Lord's with us. The only way I can when adversity strikes and pressure mounts and temptation arises, the only way I can walk in the counsel of the Lord is by the Lord himself. And therefore, may I always walk with him and not walk away. Israel, your fault was not your God. It was your sin. It was your desire to walk contrary to him. So God sent his son to them. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. My God is with me. He, he, even at the cross, the Lord walked and was determined. He, he lamented. Remember, he was, he was sweating drops of blood. He was lamenting if there's any other way to, to go except this way. And yet he said, no, nevertheless, not my will, thy will be done. I will walk according to the way of the cross. I will go into the path of adversity. I will do what is before me because my God is with me. He will help me. He will overcome. In fact, we even know that as you read the text, all three of the Godhead were there in raising Jesus from the dead the Son, the Spirit, and the Father. My God will help me. And he did, and he sat him at a place at his right hand. And I know the same thing. Because I'm in Christ, my God will help me. He will deliver me. He will free me. He will set me free. He will, he will guide me. He will direct me. And though whatever I face and whatever you face at the moment that may seem insurmountable, it may seem like there's no hope, there's no solution, there's no right way, there's no, no deliverance. And the Lord is saying, is my hand too short? You know, it, it, I think of, you know, the Lord, I mean, the Lord's like, I, I can extend deep into wherever you're at and pick you up. The Lord is not hindered. He, he, he doesn't have this, these T-Rex arms, you know, I can't even reach anything. You know, he doesn't have that. He's like, are you kidding? You don't think I have the power, the ability? I can stretch into the deepest situation of your life and I can overcome it. I can deliver you from it. Just turn to the Lord. For the Lord will help me, therefore will I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, 
and I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justify me. He will contend with me. Let's stand together. Whom is my adversary? Let him come near to me. What it's basically saying is, hey, if there's any that want to come and challenge me and, and come against me, come now. Where are my adversaries? You're going to come and you're going to be contrary to me? Be the whole, the Lord will help me, he says. It, it has that understanding of basically that it has that court proceeding understanding that basically those will come and they will say as they walk by you wagging their finger, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. And for me, I can say as the enemy tries to condemn us and, and, and come against us, and you know how he does it. He speaks in your own head. You know, you're worthless, you're nobody, you, you did it unto yourself, you're no good, God doesn't love you, you're not even saved, and he condemns you for the things that he tempts you in doing, and you can say, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. I've been forgiven. The blood of Jesus Christ has covered me. Where are my accusers? Where are my adversaries? They are none because the Lord has delivered me. And I need to walk in that counsel. The Lord has freed me. There are some that will never let your past mistakes go. Never. <laughs> Sometimes it's within our own families, isn't it? We, we had that. We had family members reminding of us how, how horrible we were in the past, you know? Or the things we used to do. And I'm like, well, you know, God's forgiven me. Who are you to call the kettle black, you know? And I'm like, just a black burnt kettle that the Lord has redeemed. He's cleaned up this, this grill and, it, and then he made it new. But the Lord has delivered us. The Lord has forgiven us. Where are our adversaries? Let them come. The Lord is my help. Behold, the Lord will help me. He, he, is, he is the one that will deliver me. It, it, he will justify me. Behold, the Lord will help me. He shall, um, who is it? He shall condemn. Lo, they shall wax old as a garment. The moth shall eat them up. The Lord will take care of the adversaries. The Lord will take care of the enemies. He, he will devour them before your eyes. He will consume the things that have oppressed you. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obey the voice of his servant? He's calling out to his people. Who among you is here that fears the Lord? Who, who has a relationship with Jesus Christ? Know that he died for your sins. Know that he's the son of God and forgiven you of your sins and ra was raised from the dead. Who of you have that heart for the Lord, the fear of the Lord? The Lord has forgiven you. He's redeemed you. Who among you is he that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that, that walketh in darkness and has no light? Uh, basically, the, the concept is that who is here that fears the Lord but is in a situation that is unsure and darkened? Well, you can trust the Lord. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because the Lord is with me. I can trust that the Lord's with me. He's going to lead me. He's going to walk with me. Remember, he's speaking again to Israel. Israel, you're, you're in a troubled time. You're in a, a time of great captivity. I am going to free you. I'm going to walk you out of it. I'm going to lead you back into your land. I'm going to deliver you. You don't know what's going on. You're fearful. You're wondering, is God abandon us? No, if you fear the Lord and you're in a dark place, trust in the Lord. If you fear the Lord and you don't know what's going on, trust the Lord. If you fear the Lord and you're not making sense of what's going on in your life right now, trust the Lord. Trust him. I don't know what's going on. Trust the Lord. Well, I, I still don't know what's going on. It's okay. Trust the Lord. 
Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of the Lord, his servant, that walk in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord. And stay upon the Lord. That means to lean on him. Oh, I don't know. I'm going to have to figure out something. What are you going to figure out? Well, how to get out of it. How to change it. How to overcome it. What's your bright idea? Well, it's a financial thing. I think I'll get another credit card. Yeah, that's worked. Yeah, that always works. Why don't, you, why don't you double it? Why don't you triple, you know, mortgage your loan? Why don't you, well, yeah. Let, let's do something like that again. It always worked in the past. No, it hasn't. But I just don't know what to do. Trust the Lord. Yeah, but I don't know what to do. Trust the Lord. Yeah, but I still don't know what to do. Trust the Lord. That's what you do. Well, I got to do something. Fine. Go stick your head in a bowl of, of spaghetti and sauce and trust the Lord. No. <laughs> I remember some comic thing that said something like that. What do we do? You pray and read the Bible. What do you do? You pray and read the Bible. What do you really do? Okay, you stick your feet in cold spaghetti and you pray and read the Bible. Cold spaghetti. That's the answer. That's what I do. No, you trust the Lord. That's what you do. And you lean on the Lord. And you, and you determine that my life is in the Lord and I'm going to depend on him and he's going to answer and he's a present help. And I'm going to put all my cares upon him and I'm going to let him have my life and I'm going to wake up every morning wanting to serve him and I'm going to look to do his will and I'm going to let God take care of everything. And I'm going to let him deal with all the external issues because what I'm going to do is I'm going to lean on the Lord my God who has come down to save and redeem me, who has not forsaken me and never will forget me and right now is praying on my behalf. I'm going to trust the Lord and I'm not going to allow the enemy to overcome me with fear and worry and doubt and anxiousness and lies and accusations. Because I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been forgiven by Jesus Christ. He engraved me in the palms of his hands, and my name's written in the Lamb's book of life. I have a mansion and a place prepared for me in heaven. And I intend to get there. That's one place I know I'm going to go. We, when we got our house, this is such a side issue, you know, but anyways... You know, when we got our house, I, I was like, you know, it was a little tiny house. We we're like, hey, this is a great starter home. We're, we're going to, five years max, honey, five years max, and we'll, it, we'll come out of the woods. We'll have a bigger home, five years max. 35 years later, we added an upstairs to it, but it's the same home. We never, never left the woods, never came out. I thought I was going to. But there's a home I know I am going to. And that's a home in glory. Because my God has redeemed me. He's forgiven me and he's with me. Why should I not trust him? Do I think he's not powerful enough to save me? He already demonstrated it. So you who are fearful, you who, who are obedient, even though you're walking in a dark place you don't understand. And there's not really any light solution for your problem. I got an answer for you. Trust the Lord. Okay, no, what really is the answer? <laughs> Trust the Lord and lean on him. Stay upon the Lord, be with him, wait on him, lean on him, rely on him. Allow him to be your all in all. And now he speaks to the enemy. I mean, now he goes and says, you do that, I'll take care of this. Okay, what do I do? Just stay with me. Okay, just, you know, it's like a little kid, just stay. Stay right here, stay, don't move, don't, don't, don't. That was my mom to me as a toddler. Don't, don't, don't move. She knew I'd be taken off, you know, somewhere. Something looked interesting to climb on and to run to. Stay. Hold on to this. Grab it. Both hands. Don't let go. Stay. 
I'm just going over here. I know this is even too far for you, but just stay right here. And the Lord's like, just stay, just wait. Just wait upon me, just rely on me, trust me, lean on me. I will be with you, I'll guide you, I'll take care of you. Okay, now you stay there, you're trusting me, right? Okay. Your enemy, your problem, let me handle this. Vengeance is mine, let me take care of this. So he says in verse 11, Behold, all you that kindle a fire, that compass yourself about with sparks, walk in the light of your own fire. All you that are caught, you troublemakers that are bugging my people out there, and walk in the sparks of your own fire you have kindled, this shall you have of my hand. Boy, you never want to get backed in by the Lord and you shall lie down in sorrow. It, it, the word actually is in torment. He will take care of everything else. You who are born again and love the Lord, trust in the Lord. Stay upon him. He's your present help in time of trouble. But Kirk, what about, let him deal with the whatabouts? He's pretty good about the whatabouts. He, he will deal with that. You just stay on him. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word and thank you for the time in your word together. Thank you for your goodness and your grace, your mercy and your love. We even now, Lord, look to you. We even now ask for your deliverance for you to restore. For those that don't know you, that you would be their Savior and Lord. Help us to stay. Help us to wake up like you, seeking your counsel, walking according to your will. And help us to trust in you in every situation and to stay, to lean upon you, to, to be surrendered to you. And allow you to, to be Lord. And that you will take care of that which we face. Thank you. When you declared to Israel, I didn't forsake you or forget you. I sent my son for you. And he demonstrated his love that while you were yet sinners, he died for you. Thank you, Lord. We can truly trust in you. We love you, we praise you, we thank you for this time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Would the worship team come forward, please? Yeah. 
So you're in a real pickle, a real mess, a situation. You don't know what to do, where to go. You don't know how to, to get out of it. You have no idea, and you're looking for an answer. Church, what is the answer? What should you do? Regular Spaghetti and regular, okay. All right, sit down. We're going through this message again. We're going through it all over. Um, yes, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord and stay upon him. Lean on the Lord. It's not the last thing you should do. It's the first, the best, the only, the most important. Trust the Lord. And then as you trust him and you're leaning on him, he illuminates the path before you. He takes his word and lights up a direction and he declares his will and you're surrendered now to do his will. And he fights the enemies and he deals with the issues. So trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. He will direct your path. He will do it. So trust in the Lord. Father, thank you for giving us this time. Thank you for your grace and goodness. Thank you for your, the opportunity to come and gather together. 
Lord, we pray that even now you would just cause our hearts to trust you, to lean upon you, to surrender to you and to hear you and to seek you. Thank you for being our Redeemer, our God, our King, our friend, our Savior. Thank you for this day. May you bless my brothers and sisters and all their doings. In Jesus' name, amen.